Good evening and welcome to the Exploratorium and to Everything Matters, Tales from the Periodic Table. Tonight, we are going to explore the element calcium. Whose favorite element is calcium? Yeah, yay. So I wanted to ask a couple questions. Who has been to After Dark before? Raise your hand, okay. How many people, and you got, everyone got your collectible calcium card? Excellent. Well, you should all have that because they were on your seat. But this is just one of a series you should know about. We have, from the previous weeks, 19 other cards. I hope you all came to all 19 of them to get your cards. But I believe we may have a set of them on the tables back there if you want to fill it in. But you'll have to come to the next one to get the next card. So, we want you to build a complete set. This is the 20th element, the 20th Everything Matters, Tales from the Periodic Table. We have a long way to go, so settle back. Uh, I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, for the evening, and uh, we are going to, this program is gonna last for mm, 45, 60 minutes in that range there. Uh, we have two people talking. My, I'm gonna first talk a little bit about the element itself and its chemistry and its physical properties and where it's used and who discovered it and things like that. And I'm gonna be followed by Jessica Kendall Barr. Jessica studied, Jessica fans? <laughs> wow. Jessica studied, I have to read this because I don't, I want to make this precise. Jessica studied marine science and integrative biology at UC Berkeley. She's a scientist and an artist. She's passionate about communicating scientific discoveries through illustration and animation. Jessica will talk uh, about minute plankton shells and how they play a role in pumping carbon from the atmosphere to the ocean depths. And that's going to happen right after I finish. I know you want me to finish really quick. So let's just move into it right now. Calcium, again, is, uh, if we look at the periodic table, it's uh, sort of in that second column over here, and calcium is the element number 20, uh, the atomic number, the one you see up here in the corner. It tells you how many protons there are in the nucleus. That uniquely identifies the element. How many protons? That gives you the element, also gives you the number of electrons, the same. Uh, and so calcium, this is again our 20th, uh, everything matters, and so it makes sense that Calcium's number 20. It is again in that second column over there which contains the alkaline earth metals. You can see calcium down there, the third one down. And uh, calcium gets its name from the Latin calx, which means lime. And so the word calcium was taken from that. It was um, discovered, well, it was actually refined first by this guy who seems to be in every single Everything Matters. He's always the first guy to seem, well, for the most part, that has uh, been able to purify these things in a pure form. This is Sir Humphrey Davy, and he actually did not isolate calcium until 1808 in England. And he actually took a mixture of lime and mercuric oxide, which is why we're not going to be doing that tonight as a demonstration. And he uh, passed a current through that and collected calcium over on one electrode, and the other electrode uh, probably had mercury on it. So uh, calcium was, but it, calcium metal itself was really not available industrially until the beginning of the 20th century. But he still was able to do that back in 1808. Calcium metal, where you think about calcium, we all think about chalk and bones and teeth. We think of this white substance, but calcium is actually a metal. And it looks, here's the, here's, this is a sample here. I don't, you probably can't see it because it's too small to see here, but it's kind of sparkly you can see in there. And I'll just magnify this. This is, this is the sample I have in my hand right now. You can see it's a very sparkly kind of almost golden co colored metal. Um, you can sort of see, if you look real closely here, you can see that there's kind of cubes of calcium. These are calcium crystals here. Um, that's one uh, form of calcium. I have another sample here. and You can come up and check these out after. Keep them so they don't break. This is another sample of calcium metal, and we can take a look closer look at that. These are a little bit oxidized, so this is a little grayish uh, compared to the other one, but this is a 99.9% .9 pure sample, so they're very pure samples of calcium. 
Calcium is, uh, as far as rarity goes, is pretty common. Uh, it's the twelfth most common element in the universe. Uh, if we move on to the sun, well, you might not be surprised that it, since the sun is kind of made out of the stuff that the universe is made out of, it's also the twelfth most abundant element in the sun. But if you move a little closer now, we look at meteorites in the solar system. It's the ninth most abundant element in meteorites. It's the fifth most abundant element in the crust of the earth. So there's a lot of calcium in the crust of the earth. It's the 12th most abundant in the oceans. And in us, it is the fifth most abundant element in our bodies. So beyond oxygen and hydrogen and carbon and nitrogen, the next one is calcium. So we're, we have a lot of calcium in us. Calcium is made inside of big stars. See, the green color there tells you that calcium is made inside of big stars, mainly by adding, well, helium nuclei together, alpha particles. Um, we, won't have, we won't talk too much about the nucleosynthesis of, uh, of uh, calcium, but there's lots of different forms of calcium. Now, remember I said that if it has 20 um, protons, that means it's calcium, but there can be different numbers of neutrons. Now, if you add together the protons plus the neutrons in the nucleus, you get the numbers that you see above the calcium symbols here from uh, 34 to 57. So these are called isotopes. They all behave exactly chemically the same, um, but they have different weights. So calcium 34 with, has 20 uh, protons and 14 neutrons in the nucleus. This has 20 protons and 15 neutrons, this and so on. These are all called isotopes. Iso meaning the same, topes meaning place, like a topographic map. Um, and that means they all occupy the same space at the, in the uh, periodic table. Now, of these 24 isotopes, only four of them are stable. They're not radioactive, oh, sorry, five of them are stable and not radioactive. And those are these right here, which is calcium 40, 42, 43, 44, and 46. Um, and they occur in different abundances in nature. Calcium 40 is the main isotope in nature. 96% of, of the calcium in nature is calcium 40. And you can see varying percentages for the others. Um, however, there's one more that actually does occur in nature, even though it's not stable. And that is calcium 48. And it actually take, is actually quite a lot of calcium. It's uh, almost 0.2% of all calcium is this radioactive form of calcium, calcium 48. Um, so it's not a stable isotope, it's radioactive. But it's kind of interesting, because this isotope is interesting, because Everything that's radioactive has a half-life. It's decaying. And so it takes a certain amount of time for half of any lump of potassium 48, uh, sorry, of calcium 48 to decay. And calcium 48 is pretty interesting because it takes five times 10 to the 19th years for half of it to decay. That's a big number. That's almost 54 quintillion years. It's not very radioactive. By the way, the universe is only 13.8 billion years old. That means that for half of a lump of calcium 48 to decay, that's four billion times the age of the universe. So for all intents and purposes, we can call it stable. It's pretty stable. So what are some other things about calcium? With density is interesting. The density of calcium is uh, one and a half grams per cubic centimeter. Compare that to water. That water is one gram per cubic centimeter. So it's a little denser than water. It would sink in water. You can compare that to some of the others down here below. Uh, gasoline is less dense than water, which is why it floats on water. And we can go all the way down to the densest element, osmium, 22 and a half grams per cubic centimeter. But I have here some elements on the table, which you can come on up and take a look at after. Um, and I have a good range of densities up here. Actually, I don't have, there's a couple of these that aren't on this chart right here. The, it's not really an element, the one labeled MA for maple and PL for plastic um, are not on this chart because they're not actually elements, but um, they're lower density. But the elements I have up here are tungsten, lead, steel, copper, and aluminum, and magnesium, 
and there is calcium, way down there. So calcium has a pretty low density compared to the rest of the elements. There's only a few elements like lithium and beryllium that kind of beat out calcium, and of course all the gases are uh, virtually zero. So uh, this is a pretty light element. So come on up after and lift these, feel what density is all about. When you, if you come up after and you lift the tungsten, piece of tungsten, be careful. It's extremely dense, and if you drop it on your toe, it will definitely leave a mark. So the calcium atom is kind of like taking a, a, an, arg an argon, sorry, yeah, an argon atom and adding two electrons to it. So there's only two electrons in the outer shell of um, uh, calcium, and it would really like to get rid of those two electrons. And it can, it's not holding on to them very strong. It can get rid of them pretty easily, so calcium does form compounds with a lot of things. Um, because of those two electrons out there hanging out there kind of loose, calcium tends to be a large atom if we compare it to the size of hydrogen. You can see calcium is quite a large atom. Uh, it has an interesting spectrum. If we, here's, this is the periodic table of the spectra. And if we look at calcium, bring out calcium here, it has a lot of bright colors in the oranges, reds, and yellows. And if you put a calcium salt, like calcium chloride, into a flame, it will make, turn the flame orange. I don't, unfortunately, I don't have that here tonight. But uh, give it a try. Go home and put some calcium chloride. Go get some calcium chloride and put it in a flame in your, on your stove. You'll see a nice orange flame. More interesting about this spectrum is if we look at the spectrum of stars. The spectrum of our sun looks something like this. It actually is a continuous spectrum uh, with all of Roy G. Biv in there, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. But the solar spectrum is crossed by dark lines. If you, took, if you made a spectroscope and looked at the sun, you'd find there were colors missing. And these colors, missing colors, were given letters early on, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on. Uh, those letters actually do not stand for any elements. Uh, they were just given in order from red to violet. But if we actually assign the uh, major letters there, the elements that are causing them, you can see that they're caused by oxygen and hydrogen and sodium. And these are elements in the outer, cooler atmosphere of the sun. They're not giving off light, they're absorbing light. And so the sun, which is made out of a compact hydrogen and helium, is giving off a continuous spectrum, just like a tungsten filament gives off all colors, because it's also compact, it's a solid. The surface, the lower surface of the sun, the denser part of the sun gives off all colors, but the rarefied outer atmosphere of the sun absorbs specific colors specific to atoms. And so by looking at the dark colors in the solar spectrum, you can tell what, is, what gases are in the sun. So we can tell here oxygen is in the sun, hydrogen, this red color of hydrogen is called hydrogen alpha. There's also a hydrogen beta in the kind of the uh, cyanish part of the spectrum, and it, there's a hydrogen gamma, alpha, beta, gamma, that's in the violet part of the spectrum. But notice, it's hard to see, just, it's actually almost past human vision. In the near ultraviolet part of the spectrum, there are some super strong lines due to calcium. And these are actually the, these are actually the strongest lines in the solar spectrum, and they're called the H and K lines. You can think they're labeled right there, H and K. Now, if you look at the sun with just visible light, you would see something that looks like this. Yellow sun with some sunspots in this case. But if you looked at the sun, for instance, in just the light of that hydrogen alpha, that red color, and you had a special filter on your telescope, you would see something that looks like this. Now, these, those, both of those pictures were taken at the same time. I'll go back. There's the sun in visible light. And there's the sun in hydrogen light. Notice you see different details. You see the dark, these dark stripes right here are uh, arcs of gas above the surface of the sun. You still see that sunspot right there. We, if you look in calcium light, this is this picture you see. See yet something different. Here you're looking a little further in. Um, and if you go even further into the ultraviolet, like the Solar Dynamics Observatory does, you see really interesting stuff. And you can go up to the observatory, and on the observatory screen, we do have some current 
pictures from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, so you can check that out. Speaking of light given off by calcium, you may have heard of this term. Have you ever heard of limelight? Being in the limelight? Well, theater lights used to have a little cylinder of calcium oxide, which was heated up with a torch, a hydrogen-oxygen torch. These were all the footlights down below the stage there. Can you imagine? Um, all lit up by little torches. When you heat calcium oxide up very hot, it gives off a very nice whitish light. Here's an actual limelight. They don't use these anymore because wh nobody really wants to have flaming hydrogen sitting at the, at the front of the stage there. A little bit hazardous. But that calcium oxide glows a really nice white light. Calcium oxide also can be used for other things. Calcium oxide is used as a desiccant. You've probably seen these packages that you get in various food things. Calcium oxide could be one of those packages. There's several different forms of, uh, of uh, desiccant, but calcium oxide is one of them. Uh, lime, uh, which is just a chemical of calcium, is used to make most of the glass that you use, called soda lime glass. You kind of tell it's kind of a, it has a little greenish color to it, uh, but most of your glassware is soda lime glass. All the bottles, the brown bottles and the green bottles, those are all soda lime glass. Windows are all soda lime glass. It's the most common form of glass for window panes and again, bottles and jars and food containers and commodity items. But uh, you, and you can kind of make glass bakeware out of soda lime glass, but it's not as uh, heat shock resistant as Pyrex. And Pyrex is not a lime-based glass. It's a boron-based glass, which we talked about a little bit if you were here for boron. What other uh, things can we do we have with, uh, let's see, with uh, calcium? Gypsum. Gypsum is a uh, kind of an important element for us. We all have seen gypsum in one form or another. Uh, here's a kind of a pretty form. These are, these are called desert roses. And this is gypsum in a matrix with a different, another uh, 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 mineral called barite. So uh, available in the store. Um, I have to say that. Oh, I forgot to say that these calendars are also available in the store, both in small and large versions. So I have to do the marketing, I'm sorry. Otherwise, the, our, our per, Julie gets upset at me. It's okay. So gypsum um, is found both in small crystalline form like this, but large crystals, these are large crystals in a cave in Mexico. Notice there's a person right down here. Just to give you a scale, those crystals are probably 20 or 30 feet tall. This looks like a set of a science fiction movie to me. Uh, I would love to go see these. I hear it's really hard to go see these, though, that this, this cavern is like at 95 degrees. It's really, really hot. Where is the most common place you see gypsum? Here. <coughs> you see it in drywall also known as plasterboard or wallboard or gypsum panel or sheet rock um, or gypsum board. Um, it's uh, much more efficient than plaster. It takes like a week to plaster a room with plaster on, on the wood lav, but if you do it with sheet rock, you can get a whole, you can get a room, you can get a whole house done in like a few days. So this is a much more efficient way. It's, it's a good insulator, both for heat and sound. So uh, it's, a, it's a good uh, material and it's really cheap too. Uh, another fun mineral, which you can find also in our store, uh, is eulexite. Eulexite is also known as TV rock. Eulexite kind of forms a natural fiber optic. So anything that is on the back also appears on the front. So you can see the, the, in the box here, it just says TV rock and if I put this on top, you can probably, I don't know if you can see this with the camera, maybe I'll hold it up to this camera over here. I told them that they didn't have to do this, but uh, at least the people online will be able to see it. You can come up after the folks in the audience here and play with these. Another chemical that's commonly found is calcium chloride. And uh, this is actually used quite a bit we don't use it around here at all, but it is used in the mountains and on the East Coast. They spread this on the roads to keep 
the road, uh, water on the road from freezing into ice on the road and have cars sliding all over the place. So here you can see that's spreading uh, the calcium chloride on the road and that lowers the freezing temperature of water to below the ambient temperature. Uh, so water won't freeze until it's like minus 62 degrees Fahrenheit if you have calcium chloride on the road. Calcium chloride is also used as a desiccant. So there's another desiccant package. There's also one called silica gel, but that has no calcium in it, so we don't have to talk about it. One of the mo best known uh, minerals is calcite. Calcite is a, uh, comes in all kinds of forms. We have, uh, in our store, we have orange calcite and green calcite and blue calcite. And then this amazing form right here, which is very pure calcite. This is called an Icelandic spar variety, but this is clear, no coloring into it. And it also, you can see the crystal up there. It's, a, it's kind of a rhombic crystal. Uh, there's no right angles here. And this uh, has an interesting refractive properties, which I can talk to you about after if you want to come up and ask about that. Uh, in Caves, you see calcite. Here's a photo of um, Carlsbad Cavern. This, when you have water that has a high content of calcium carbonate in it, it can actually precipitate out and form stalactites hanging down from the ceiling or stalagmites working their way up to the ceiling. Uh, this right here, this rock right here, is, doesn't, doesn't look like what, what's really inside. Inside of this is a piece of obsidian, volcanic rock. And this piece of obsidian was placed in a cave in France where the water has extremely high concentrations of calcium carbonate. And it drips on the anything in there and forms a crunchy shell around, the, around anything. Um, so this is actually a piece of black obsidian, but it has a beautiful coating of calcium carbonate, the same as all the rocks get inside of Carlsbad Caverns. So you should come up and check that out too after. Calcium carbonate also is seen in the white cliffs of Dover. So here you see these beautiful white cliffs. They're actually on the southern, uh, southeastern uh, uh, tip of uh, the United Kingdom of England. It forms about a 10 mile stretch of coast out there. And even though this is a massive uh, uh, edifice that you see here, it's actually made out of little tiny things. It's made out of little tiny biologicals. Uh, coccoliths, these little plates right here, form spheres. Co 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 I can't even pronounce that, coccosphere. And uh, that is what uh, Jesse's going to be talking to us in a little bit. But of course, those white cliffs of Dover, you can just mine it for chalk. So chalk is another form of calcium carbonate. But in this case, it's made out of little tiny things. So it's not a crystal that looks like this. It's little tiny things that are not tightly held together. So it works really well when you're scribbling on a, on a chalkboard, which I don't think there are many more of. We've managed to move them out. Um, another form of calcium carbonate is this mineral called aragonite. And it's kind of important because um, here's just one form of it. It's actually little um, sharp crystals you see there. Um, it, it forms into another form here. This is actually called a Sputnik of aragonite. And there's one right here which you can see. Uh, come on up and check it out. I just like to put a big one up there so you can see it without, because these are hard to see here. Um, this aragonite is dissolved in the oceans of the, uh, of the earth, and this is what shells are formed from. So without aragonite in the ocean, you don't get shells forming, and you don't get shells forming when the acidity of the ocean gets too high, um, because uh, the shells dissolve as fast as they form. So if you look at the concentration of aragonite over time, here you're going to see from uh, 1861 to 2100. This is a visualization done by uh, NASA. And we're running through the years really quick here, but watch what happens. Everything's going along just fine. We have enough uh, aragonite, this blue color, to form shells, not a problem. But if we keep adding carbon dioxide to the oceans, which Jesse's going to talk about, and raising the acidity, shells, animals will not be able to form shells. And so here we are, if 
we continue to move in the same direction that we're moving now, the ocean will become too acidic. So no more shells, and that's a serious thing. Uh, where else? In us, of course, we have calcium. There we are, a good portion of our bodies. The calcium in our body is uh, uh, formed around a collagen framework um, with calcium phosphate forming the hard parts of the bone, and actually it's called calcium hydro hydroxyapatite. That's what forms the hard part of the bone. Um, your teeth enamel are also formed, and your teeth are also formed of calcium, specifically hydroxyapatite, except it's even more mineralized in your teeth. Your teeth are a lot harder than your bones. They're the hardest things in the human body, actually. Well, they have to last for a lifetime. Uh, there's one more place where calcium does appear in the body, and this is not one that uh, anyone wants, and that's in the form of kidney stones, bladder stones, and gall stones, and these are all calcified uh, uh, stones inside your body. This uh, kidney stone here was actually the kidney stone from the mother of one of our uh, fellow employees here. <laughs> Science people, right? These are actually from a, these are bladder stones from a, from a dog. Um, these are all up in the observatory if you want to go check them out. Uh, just a couple more here. Um, limestone, very, very uh, common uh, 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 rock on the earth, used for building. You can make buildings out of limestone. In, if you metamorphose, it's a sedimentary rock, but if you squeeze it and heat it, it becomes marble. And of course, marble has been used to create some of the most beautiful artworks and uh, certainly some of the most beautiful buildings in the world. Um, and if anyone has had a chance, anyone had a chance to see the Taj Mahal close up? It's amazing. Um, it's not only is it this beautiful polished marble, but it's inlaid with semi-precious stones everywhere. It's just an amazing thing to see. I encourage everyone going to India to go see this, even though it is really touristy. It's worth it. There's a reason it's touristy. And that's all I really have to say about calcium.